Get your King James Bible and turn it to the book of Nahum. Nahum is one of those minor prophets, not called minor because of their importance, but rather their size. Nahum chapter 1 and verse 3. The Lord is slow to anger and great in power and will not at all acquit the wicked. The Lord hath his way in the whirlwind and in the storm, and the clouds are the dust of his feet. Let's pick this apart a little bit. It says the Lord is slow to anger. Boy, that's good, because if he was quick to be angry with me, I'd have been dead a long time ago. And great in power. Of course, he made everything, so. And will not at all acquit the wicked. Do you know what it means to be acquitted? If you are arrested for a crime and the jury acquits you of all charges, that means, or if the judge or prosecution acquits you of all the charges, that means you're free to go. But it says, and the Lord is slow to anger and great in power and will not at all acquit the wicked. That means God is not going to let the wicked walk away for nothing, okay? The Lord hath his way in the whirlwind. And what's a whirlwind? Well, if you live in Asia, it's uh, the typhoon. If you live in America, it's the tornado, it's the earth uh, and hurricane. The Lord hath his way in the whirlwind and in the storm. And the clouds are the dust of his feet. Let's take a look at a companion verse. How about Psalms chapter 7 and verse 11? Psalms 7 11. No, that's not the convenience store. God judgeth the righteous. Hmm. You see, God's going to judge the righteous. Now, there's a difference between judgment and wrath. Okay? Everybody's going to be judged. Some are going to be under condemnation and wrath. And, you know, just judgment, being judged is not necessarily a bad thing. I mean, when you go to the county fair and there's a bake, a bakery contest, you know, uh, somebody gets the blue ribbon, somebody gets, you know, first place, second place, third place, honorable mention. You know, somebody's got to be the best. And, uh, you know, being judged is not necessarily a bad thing. Do you know that in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 2, what does it read about judge? You know, judged, judgment. Do ye not know that the saints shall judge the world? And who's the saints? That's those in Christ. Do ye not know that the saints shall judge the world? And if the world shall be judged by you, are ye unworthy to judge the smallest matters? Good question. Well, here's a couple of interesting verses. Chapter 20 of the book of Revelation, verses 12 and 13. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened. And another book was opened, which another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. Huh. So, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged out out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell 
delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged, every man, according to their works. Huh. Seems like we're going to be judged according to our works. That's very interesting, isn't it? Yet in Galatians chapter 2 and verse 16, Paul writes the following. Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law. Oh, see, there's a difference between the works of the law and works of faith. There's a difference. There's a big difference. If somebody says, oh, I'm, you know, Torah keeper, that's the works of the law. But the works of the faith, well, James chapter 2 explains that. We're going to nail that in a minute. Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. Oh, I wish everybody would read James, the book of James, especially the second chapter. James ch chapter 2, verse 10. For whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. In other words, there's over 600 different laws in the Bible, and I don't, nobody's ever kept them all except for Christ. After all, he, he's the one that gave the law to Moses. He's the one that, he's the lawgiver. He was the word made flesh. He's the only one that kept the law. Verse 11. For he that said, do not commit adultery, said also, do not kill. Now, if thou commit no adultery, yet if thou kill, thou art become a transgressor of the law. So speak ye, and so do as they that shall be judged by the law of liberty. For he shall have judgment without mercy that hath showed no mercy. Mm. So if you show no mercy, you're going to be judged without any mercy. Now let's read that again. For he shall have judgment without mercy that hath showed no mercy, and mercy rejoiceth against judgment. In Matthew 23, 23, Jesus said, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For ye pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin, and have omitted the weightier matters of the law. In other words, they measured on the minors and minored on the majors. The important things they neglected and the unimportant things they made most important. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For ye pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin and have omitted the weightier matters of the law, judgment, mercy, and faith. These ought ye to have done and not to leave the other undone. And when it talks about judgment, it's not talking about condemning people necessarily, my opinion. You see, judgment was to protect the weak, the widows, the orphans, and the powerless against the rich and powerful. That's, that's how my idea of how God works. The Pharisees were supposed to protect the weak, those of faith, instead of taking bribes like, uh, the, like rulers do to crush the needy. In Deuteronomy 24, verse 14, Thou shalt not 
oppress an hired servant that is poor and needy, whether he be of thy brethren or of thy strangers that are in thy land within, within thy gates. Hmm. Uh, interesting. Well, let's see. Psalms chapter 37, verse 14. The wicked have drawn out the sword and have bent their bow, you know, bow and arrow, and have bent their bow to cast down the poor and needy and to slay such as be of upright conversation. So it's the wicked that kill people for what little they have. In Psalm 72, 4, he says, He shall judge the poor of the people. He shall save the children of the needy and shall break in pieces the oppressor. When he's talking about judging, he's not talking about judging the poor people. He's judging what was done by the rich against the poor people. Psalm 72, 12, For he shall deliver the needy when he crieth, the poor also, and him that hath no helper. Verse 13. He shall spare the poor and needy and shall save the souls of the needy. In Psalms 82.3, this is our duty. We read as follow. Defend the poor and fatherless. Think about that. Next time you hear about Pizzagate and children missing. Defend the poor and fatherless. Do justice to the afflicted and needy. That's what it means to be judge, to do justice to the afflicted and needy. Psalms 82 verse 4. Deliver the poor and needy. Rid them out of the hand of the wicked. Does, does God change his mind just because Christ died on a cross? Do you, you think all this was nailed to the cross, done away with? Boy, I tell you what, the only thing the churches teach nowadays is, oh, the Old Testament, the laws were nailed to the cross, except for the tithe. Oh, yeah, keep that tithe. Yeah, send God your tithe, and here's our address. Deliver the poor and needy, rid them out of the land of the out, rid them out of the hand of the wicked. Oh yeah. That's that's the judgment we're supposed to make. Oh boy, book of Isaiah. I need to spend more time in the book of Isaiah. Chapter 10 and verse 1. Whoa. Whoa, and when he says whoa, he's not talking about riding a horse that's that's running too fast. Woe unto them that decree unrighteous decrees. In other words, unrighteous laws. Woe unto them that decree unrighteous decrees, and that right grievousness which they have prescribed. Do you know what, you know, like a doctor prescribes a drug? to turn aside the needy from judgment and to take away the right from the poor of my people that widows may be their prey and that they may rob the fatherless. And what will ye do in the day of visitation? Yeah, what are you going to do when Christ comes back? And what will you do in the day of visitation and in the desolation which shall come from far, to whom will ye flee for help? And where will ye leave your glory? Without me they shall bow down under the prisoners, and they shall and they shall fall under the slain. For all this for all this his anger is not turned away, but his hand is stretched out still. 
Pretty interesting, huh? Isaiah 25, verse 4, For thou hast been a strength to the poor, a strength to the needy in their distress, a refuge from the storm. A refuge from the storm, a shadow from the heat, when the blast of the terrible ones is as a storm against the wall. Okay, back to the book of James, chapter 2, verse 13. For he shall have judgment without mercy, that have showed no mercy, and mercy rejoiceth against judgment. What doth it profit, my brethren, though a man say he hath faith and have not works? Can faith save him? Didn't we read that uh, in Revelation that people were going to be judged out of the books by their, uh, out of the books they were going to be judged by their works? I heard somebody say that works are the cart that follow the horse drawing it of faith. You know, works always follows faith. Now, when people are doing works of the law, saying, well, I keep Torah, I keep the law. No, you don't, you liar. No, you don't. You might keep some of them, but you don't keep all of them, and you can't. Works always follows faith. Verse 15, if a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food. Yeah, suppose you have a, a brother or sister in Christ. They're naked. They don't have any clothes and it's winter and they don't have any food. Verse 16, and one of you say unto them, depart in peace, be ye warmed and filled. Notwithstanding, you give them not those things which are needful to the body. What doth it profit? What good are you if you don't give them a, a, a winter coat and a, and, a, and a, you know, a meal? Verse 17, Even so faith, if it hath not works, is dead being alone. Yeah, you're going to be judged by what you do because what you do is proof of what you believe. Verse 18, yea, a man may say, thou hast faith and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works. And I will show thee my faith by my works. Thou believest that there is one God? Thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. But wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? Ooh. Here's an interesting verse, Revelation chapter 2 and verse 24. But I say unto you, and unto the rest in Thyatira, as many as have not this doctrine, and which have not known the depths of Satan, as they speak, I will put upon you none other burden, but that which ye have already. Hold fast till I come. And he that overcometh and keepeth my works... Boy, I tell you what, there's a, lot, there's a lot of theology in this verse. And he that overcometh and keepeth my works unto the end, to him will I give power over the nations. And he shall rule them with an rod of iron, as the vessels of a potter shall they be broken to shivers, even as I received of my father, and I will give him the morning star. And if you read in Revelation chapter, I think it's 22, Jesus is the morning star. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Yeah, quick note. Revelation 22, verse 16, the morning star. I, Jesus have sent mine angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David, 
Now, how can Christ be the root and the offspring of David? Well, Christ created Adam and Eve from the dust of the earth. He's God in the flesh. So he was the root of David, and yet he's the offspring of David. He is through the line of David. I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright and morning star. Now, when you read Isaiah 14, uh, in the King James, it says, Lucifer fell from heaven. If you read in uh, the NIV and the complete Jewish Bible from so-called Messianic Jew J David Stern, the morning star fell from heaven and is going down to the pit of hell. So, do you believe the King James Bible that Lucifer is going to hell? Or do you believe the Messianic Jewish Bible and the NIV, number one bestseller, that Jesus, the morning star, well, Jesus says he's the morning star. Do you believe the morning star is going to hell? Or do you believe the Lucifer is going to hell? And when people argue with you and tell you, well, Lucifer is a Latin word. It doesn't belong in the Bible. Um, well, you know, 20% of the English language is, is Latin. So I guess they can delete all those Latin words like corpse and omni and ultra. Those are Latin words. I guess they don't belong in the Bible either, right? Which is why I say stick with the King James. Okay, back to Psalms chapter 7 and 11. God judgeth the righteous. Oh yeah, God does judge the righteous. And God is angry, angry with the wicked every day. Wow. God judgeth the righteous, and God is angry with the wicked every day. Oh, I love this. Psalms chapter 2 and verse 12. Kiss the sun. Not the sun in the sky. The S-O-N. Kiss the sun. Who? Kiss the son of God. Jesus said he's the son of God. Sorry, the um, Jews and the Muslims, neither one of them believe that, but I do. Kiss the son, lest he be angry, and ye perish from the way. When his wrath is kindled but a little, blessed are all they that put their trust in him. So does that give new meaning to the book of Nahum 1.3? The lowest Lord is slow to anger and great in power and will not at all acquit the wicked. The Lord hath his way in the whirlwind and in the storm, and the clouds are the dust of his feet. So what does the Bible say about a storm? Isaiah chapter 4 and verse 6. And there shall be a tabernacle for a shadow in the daytime from the heat, and for a place of refuge, and for a covert from storm and from rain. Isaiah 25, 4. For thou hast been a strength to the poor, a strength to the needy in their, his distress, a refuge from the storm, a shadow from the heat when the blast of the terrible ones is as a storm against the wall. Are these... Verses, I know I'm repeating a few of them, but, you know, it, it's like a jigs, uh, jigsaw puzzle, you know? Pieces fit together. In Isaiah 28, verse 2, Behold, the Lord hath a mighty and strong one, which, as a tempest of hail and a destroying storm, as a flood of mighty waters overflowing, shall cast down to the earth with the hand.
Now, obviously, the Lord controls the weather. He can send the rain. He can withhold the rain. All right, for example, in Genesis 2, 5, And every plant of the field before it was in the earth, and every herb of the field before it grew, for the Lord God had not caused it, for the Lord God had not caused it to rain upon the earth, and there was not a man to till the ground. Genesis 7, 4. For yet seven days, and I will cause it to rain, and I will cause it to rain, Upon the earth, forty days and forty nights, and every living substance that I have made will I destroy from off the face of the earth. Go to Deuteronomy chapter 11. We're going to read 14 verse and then 17 verse. That I will give you the rain of your land in his due season, the first rain and the latter rain, rain that thou mayest gather in thy corn and thy wine and thine oil. And then the Lord's wrath be kindled against you, and he shut up the heaven, that there be no rain, and that the land yield not her fruit, and lest ye perish quickly from off the good land which the Lord giveth you. And if you read, Deuteronomy 28, you can read, uh, you know, the Lord's blessing upon and the Lord's curse is upon. Oh, let's see. Deuteronomy 28, verse 12. The Lord shall open unto he, thee his good treasure, the heaven to give the rain unto thy land in his season, and to bless all the work of thine hands, and thou shalt lend unto many nations, and thou shalt not borrow. That used to be America. We used to lend to everybody, and we didn't borrow. But guess what? We were disobedient. Now it's the opposite. Just like Deuteronomy 28 said. Let's look at 24. 28, 24. The Lord shall make the rain of thy land powder, and dust from heaven shall it come down upon thee until thou be destroyed. Read in the, um, I think it was in the 1930s, the Dust Bowl, didn't rain. Well, we had rain. It was called dust, dust storms. People died in the dust storms. One guy was caught in the open field, and the dust was so bad it got in his eyes, and he went blind. People had to seal themselves in their houses. From the dust storms. They were so thick. You couldn't even breathe. Horrible. In Deuteronomy 32. Verse 2. The Lord says. My doctrine shall drop. As the rain. My speech shall distill as the dew. As the small rain upon the tender herb. And as the showers upon the grass. Do you want the Lord's doctrine or do you want the devil's doctrine? In the first book of Kings, chapter 8, verses 35 and 36, boy, if only the places in drought would read this verse. Now, California was in drought for a long time, but they just got a big, huge storm uh, it's like they got all the rain and, oh, I mean, not rain, but they got all the snow and everything in like one shot. Um, now they're going to have the melting of the snow. They're going to have mudslides and, you know, that's what happens. You get drought. The trees were all dying. The vegetation all died. The ground was just left barren. And then when you get rain, it, the, the, it just turns to mud and then mudslides and just washes away because you don't have any tree roots or, and plant roots holding the soil together. You know, so... All right, 1 Kings 8, 35. When heaven is shut up and there is no rain because they have sinned against thee, oh, the 
Has California sinned against the Lord? Uh, let's see. I've got one city I can think of. San Francisco. When heaven is shut up and there is no rain because they have sinned against me, if they pray toward this place and confess thy name hmm. and turn from their sin. Wow. And what's, their, what's his name? Matthew chapter 1 says his name is Jesus. Book of Matthew, chapter 1 and verse 16. And Jacob begat Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called Christ. Matthew 1, 21. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus. I don't read Yeshua there anywhere. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Matthew 1.25 And knew her not till she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. Okay? I know the Jews want you to think that this is wrong, and it should say Yeshua, but it doesn't. I'm sorry, it doesn't say Yeshua anywhere. How about the book of Mark 1.1? 1, 1. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Didn't the Bible say, kiss the Son lest he be angry? The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. How about another witness? Book of Luke 1.31. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and bring forth a son, and shalt call his name Jesus. This was an angel, okay? How about Luke 2.21? Luke chapter 2, verse 21. And when eight days were accomplished for the circumcising of the child, his name was called Jesus, which was so named of the angel before he was conceived in the womb. All right, let's go back to 1 Kings chapter 8, and verse 35. When heaven is shut up and there is no rain, because they have sinned against thee, if they pray toward this place and confess thy name and turn from their sin, when thou afflictest them, then hear thou in heaven and forgive the sin of thy servants and of thy people Israel, that thou teach them the good way wherein they should walk and give rain unto thy land, which thou hast given to thy people for an, for an inheritance. Sounds like good advice, huh? You don't hear this stuff in church being preached. Oh, no. Give your tithes. Yeah, we can tithe. But uh, God forbid they... They talk about confessing his name and turning from sin. Oh boy. Even repentance. Repenting of your sin and turning from away from sin. That there's famous preachers now that are calling that heresy. Really? Really? Now, let's go to the Second Chronicles, chapter seven, and verse twelve. Now, this is, uh, this is somewhat preached. And the Lord appeared to Solomon by night and said unto him, I have heard thy prayer and have chosen this place to myself for an house of sacrifice. If I shut up heaven that there be no rain, or if I command the locusts to devour the land, or if I send pestilence, disease, or if I send pestilence among my people, if my people, which are called by my name, Christians, if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face 
and turn from their wicked ways. Then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. Ooh. Now mine eyes shall be opened and my ears attend unto the prayer that is made in this place. For now have I chosen and sanctified this house that my name may be there forever and mine eyes and mine heart shall be there perpetually. Perpetual means forever, people. That's why there's going to be a new Jerusalem. Because the Lord's going to be there forever. That's a whole nother preach study, Bible study. Now, I did Job 1 in a previous study. So, you know, please uh, please forgive me if I go, seem to go over a lot of the same material. Not everybody's a regular listener of mine. Sometimes we have new people and... You know, they don't necessarily know this stuff. So the Lord is in the wind. He's in the whirlwind judgment. And the Lord gives rain. The Lord withholds the rain. But he's not the only one. Job chapter 1. There was a land. Uh, there was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job. And that man was perfect and upright and one that feared God and eschewed evil. Eschewed means avoided and to hate. So Job feared the Lord and hated evil. Verse 2. And there was born unto him seven sons and three daughters. His substance also was 7,000 sheep and 3,000 camels and 500 yoke of oxen and 500 she-asses in a very great household so that this man was the greatest of all men of the East. In other words, he was pretty wealthy. And his sons went and feasted in their houses, every one his day, and sent and called for their three sisters to eat and to drink with them. Eat, drink, and be merry, right? And it was so when the days of their feasting was gone about that Job sent and sanctified them, rose up early in the morning, offered burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, it may be that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus did Job continually. So... Job was concerned his sons had sinned because they're the ones making feasts and drinks. I have a sneaking suspicion here that the, uh, the daughters were more righteous than the sons, but I don't know. Verse 6. Now there was a day when the sons of God, I think these are angels. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. And the Lord said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth and from walking up and down in it. Remember, Job, uh, Satan was cast out of heaven, right? And the Lord said unto Satan, verse 8, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and an upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Doth God, Job, doth Job fear God for naught? You know, does God, does Job fear, fear you for nothing? Hast not thou made an hedge about him and about his house and about all that he hath on every side? Oh yeah, you've put a, a hedge around him, a wall. You've put a shield around him. I can't touch him. You won't let me anywhere near him. Thou hast blessed the work of his hands, and his substance is increased in the land. But put forth thine hand now, and touch all that he hath, and he will curse thee to thy face. See, uh, Satan's making a bet with the Lord here. Oh yeah, you let me, you let me take care of Job, and he'll curse you. And the Lord, verse 12, And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, all that he hath is in thy power. Only upon himself put not forth thine hand. So, God gave Satan permission to do whatever he wanted to everything that Job had. 
but couldn't touch him, his life. All that he hath is in thy power. That's his sons, his daughters, his livestock, everything. Only upon himself put not, put not forth thine hand. So Satan went forth from the presence of the Lord. Verse 13. And there was a day when his sons and his daughters were eating and drinking wine in their eldest brother's house. And there came a messenger unto Job and said, The oxen were plowing and the asses feeding beside them, and the Sabaeans fell upon them and took them away. So I guess they were taken away as slaves. Yea, they have slain the servants with the edge of the sword, and I only am escaped alone to tell thee. While he was yet speaking, there came another, uh, also another, and said, The fire of God is fallen from heaven, and hath burned up the sheep. The fire of God is fallen from heaven? I don't think so. The servant might have thought this was the fire of God, but I think it was the fire from Satan. See, Satan could do miracles too. Although I could be wrong. It could actually be God that sent the fire. I, I, I admit it could go either way, but I, I personally, my opinion is, I think the fire of God that they're talking about here came from Satan, but I don't know. The, um, another thing too, when you read the book of Revelation, the false prophet is going to be able to bring fire down from the sky to devour his enemies. Matter of fact, let's take a look at that. All right, just to prove a point, Revelation 13 and 11. And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon. And he exerciseth, exerciseth all the power of the first beast before him, and caused the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. And he doeth great wonders, so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. So this is the beast making fire from heaven coming down. Okay? Uh, and he doeth great wonders, so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men, and deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by a sword and did live. And if you keep reading this, this is where it talks about 666. Okay? So, Satan has power too. All right, Job chapter 1, verse 16, back. While he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, The fire of God has fallen from heaven and hath burned up the sheep and the servants and consumed them, and I only am escaped alone to tell thee. Verse 17. While he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, The Chaldeans made out three bands and fell upon the camels and have carried them away, yea, and slain the servants with the edge of the sword, and I only am escaped alone to tell thee. A lot of people don't know it, but the Chaldeans were the um, the Babylonians. You know, they were the ones that uh, carried Jerusalem away captive. You can read about that in the book of uh, Daniel. All right. Verse 18. While he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, Thy sons and thy daughters were eating and drinking wine in their eldest brother's house. And behold, there came a great wind from the wilderness. Isn't that a storm? A tornado, perhaps? And behold, there came a great wind from the wilderness and smote the four corners of the house, and it fell upon the young men, and they are dead. And I only am escaped alone to tell thee. Then Job arose and rent his mantle and shaved his head and fell down upon the ground and worshipped and said, Naked came I out of my mother's womb and naked shall I return thither. 
the Lord gave, and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all this Job sinned not, nor charged God foolishly. You know, what's interesting is Satan had the power to touch anything except for Job's life. Life, L-I-F-E, his existence. He could have killed Job's spouse, his wife, W-I-F-E, but he didn't. You know why? Because she was doing Satan's will. Want proof? Job 2.9, Then said his wife unto him, his wife speaking to Job, Then said his wife unto him, Dost thou still retain thine integrity? Curse God and die. Curse God and die. Boy, what a, what a wonderful thing for a wife to encourage her husband, huh? Curse God and die. All right, so Satan also, with God's permission, has power in the wind and fire from the sky, from heaven. Now we read in Psalms 107, verse 25, For he commandeth, who is he? God. For he commandeth and raiseth the stormy wind, which lifteth up the waves thereof. Psalms, I'm sorry, yeah, Psalms, that was Psalms 107, 25. In Psalms 148 and verse 8, Fire and hail, snow and vapor, stormy wind, fulfilling his word. All right, so let's turn to the eighth chapter of the book of Luke and verse 22. Now it came to pass on a certain day that he, who, Christ, that he went into a ship with his disciples, and he said unto them, Let us go over unto the other side of the lake. And they launched forth. In other words, you've heard of the launching of a ship, right? Well, they were, you know, on a boat, they launched it. Verse 23. But as they sailed, he fell asleep. And there came down a storm of wind on the lake, and they were filled with water and were in jeopardy. So imagine this. There's a strong wind blowing, and there's water Waves crashing over the ship, and it's filling up with water, and they're getting ready to sink. Verse 24. And they came to him and awoke him, saying, Master, Master, we perish. Then he arose and re Who arose? Jesus. Then he arose and rebuked the wind and the raging of the water, and they ceased and there was a calm. Can you imagine that? The wind's blowing, the waves are crashing, it's dark, it's stormy, and Jesus, by his words, rebukes the wind, and then they ceased, and then everything was calm. Verse 25, And he, Jesus, and he said unto them, Where is your faith? And they, being afraid, wonder, saying one to another, What manner of man is this? For he commandeth even the winds and the waters, and they obey him. And they arrived at the country of the Gadarenes, which is over against Galilee. Yep, what manner of man is this? For he commandeth even the winds and water, and they obey him. Good question. What manner of man is this? How about Mark chapter 4? We're going to read the parallel passage of this. Second witness. Mark chapter 4, verse 35. And the same day when the even was come, evening, so it was dark. And the same day when the even was come, 
he saith unto them, Let us pass over unto the other side. And when they had sent away the multitude, they took him even as he was in the ship, and there were also with him other little ships. And there arose a great storm of wind, and the waves beat into the ship, so that it was now full. And he was in the hinder part of the ship. Now, I don't know if you know it, but when you're in the back of a ship, um, the front is going to be the part that gets hit by the waves the most. Usually the back is the uh, calmest, calmest part of the ship, the back. And he was in the hinder part of the ship, asleep on a pillow, and they awake him. And say unto him, Master, carest thou not that we perish? And he arose and rebuked the wind and said unto the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. And he said unto them, Why are ye so fearful? How is it that ye have no faith? And they feared exceedingly, and said one to another, What manner of man is this, that even the wind and the sea obey him? Turn your Bibles to Psalms 107. We're going to start in verse 1. Probably read the whole thing. O oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endureth forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. The redeemed of the Lord. Didn't Christ come to redeem us from the curse of the law? We're the redeemed. Those of us in Christ are the redeemed people. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he hath redeemed from the hand of the enemy. Weren't we redeemed from the hand of the enemy? Who's the enemy? Satan, the devil and gathered them out of the lands from the east and from the west and from the north and from the south. They wandered in the wilderness in a solitary way. They found no city to dwell in. Hungry and thirsty, their soul fainted in them. Ooh. Then they cried unto the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them out of their distresses. And he led them forth by the right way that they might go to a city of habitation. Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wondrous works to the children of men. For he satisfieth the longing soul and filleth the hungry soul with goodness, such as sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, being bound in affliction and iron. Because they rebelled against the words of God and condemned the counsel of the Most High. Therefore he brought down their heart with labor. They fell down, and there was none to help them. Then they cried unto the Lord in their trouble, and he saved them out of their distresses. He brought them out of darkness and the shadow of death, and break their bands in sunder. Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness, and for his wonderful works to the children of men. For he hath broken the gates of brass, and cut the bars of iron in sunder. Fools, because of their transgression and because of their iniquities, are afflicted. Their soul abhorreth all manner of meat, and they draw near unto the gates of death. Then they cry unto the Lord in their trouble, and he saveth them out of their distresses. He sent his word. Ooh, Jesus is called the word of God, remember? He sent his word and healed them and delivered them from their destructions. Isn't that what Jesus did? He healed people over and over and over. Verse 21. Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. And let them sacrifice the sacrifices of thanksgiving and declare his works with rejoicing that they go down in the sea and ships that do business in great waters. 
bees that see the works of the Lord and his wonders in the deep. Weren't we just reading about um, Christ rebuking the wind? Let's read this again. They that go down to the sea in ships, that do business in great waters, these see the works of the Lord and his wonders in the deep. For he commandeth and raiseth the stormy wind, which lifteth up the waves thereof. They mount up to the heaven. They go down again to the depths. Their soul is melted because of trouble. They reel to and fro and stagger like a drunken man and are at their wit's end. Then they cry unto the Lord in their trouble, and he bringeth them out of their distresses. He maketh the storm a calm. Isn't that exactly what Christ did? He maketh the storm a calm, so that the waves thereof are still. Wow, let's read that again. He maketh the storm a calm, so that the waves thereof are still. Then are they glad, because they be quiet. So he bringeth them unto their des desired haven. Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. Let them exalt him also in the congregation of the people and praise him in the assembly of the elders. He turneth rivers into a wilderness and the water springs into dry ground, a fruitful land into barrenness for the wickedness of them that dwell therein. He turneth the wilderness into a standing water and dry ground into water springs. And there he maketh the hungry to dwell that they may prepare a city for habitation and sow the fields and plant the vineyards, which may yield fruits of increase. He blesseth them also so that they are multiplied greatly and suffereth not their cattle to decrease. Again, they are minished and brought low through oppression, affliction, and sorrow. He poureth contempt upon princes and causeth them to wander in the wilderness where there is no way. Yet setteth he the poor on high from affliction and maketh his families like a flock. The righteous shall see it. The righteous shall see it and rejoice and all iniquity shall stop her mouth. Whoso is wise and will observe these things, even they that shall understand the loving kindness of the Lord. Wow. Let's go to Matthew chapter 7. And verse 17, I guess. Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit. But a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. And fruit and works is basically the same meaning. Okay? A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Wherefore, by their fruits ye shall know them. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name have cast out devils? And in thy name had many healings on TV on the Benny Hinn channel. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Um, and in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works. And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, Ah, so you got to hear the sayings and you got to do them. 
Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man which built his house upon a rock. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat upon that house, and it fell not, for it was founded upon a rock. There's a Bible verse that says, and that rock was Christ. Verse 26. And everyone that heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them not. So you got to hear and you got to do. And everyone that heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them not shall be likened unto a foolish man which built his house upon sand. And the rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat upon that house and it fell. And great was the fall of it. And it came to pass when Jesus had ended these things, the people were astonished at his doctrine. For he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. In the eighth chapter of the book of Hosea in verse 7, For they have sown the wind. What does a farmer do? He sows seed, right? For they have sown the wind, and they shall reap the whirlwind. You know, when you plant evil, guess what you're going to reap? You're going to, when you plant evil, that's going to be your harvest. When you plant in wickedness, you're going to have a bitter harvest of wickedness. For they have sown the wind, and they shall reap the whirlwind. It hath no stock, the bud shall yield no meal. If so, be it yield the stranger shall swallow it up. In the book of uh, 18th, 18th chapter of the book of Psalms, verse 2, the Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my strength, in whom I will trust, my buckler and the horn of my salvation and my high tower. In the 37th chapter of the book of Psalms, verse 40, And the Lord shall help them and deliver them. He shall deliver them from the wicked and save them because they trust in him. Psalms 118 and verse 8, It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in in man. In Proverbs chapter 3 verse 5, trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto thine own understanding. Wish I'd have done that, started doing that when I was a teenager. I had to save myself and the people around me from a lot of grief and trouble. If you're young, trust me, this works. Trust, well, trust in the Lord. Don't trust me. Trust me when I tell you to trust in the Lord. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Lean not unto thine own understanding. You'll save yourself a lot of trouble. Trust me. Well, trust the Lord. Trust me to telling you to trust the Lord. Well, we started in Nahum. Let's end in Nahum. Chapter 1 and verse 7. The Lord is good a stronghold in the day of trouble, and he knoweth them that trust in him. This is Chaplain Bob, Light of the World Ministries. All blessings, praise, glory, and honor to the Lamb of God, slain before the foundation of the world. In Jesus' name, amen.